I'm going to start with a question from, uh, please excuse my pronunciation here. I've got Jeremy Abu. Um, he's, uh, this is a question for Victor. So thanks for sharing your vision of this ambitious project. I'm concerned about how such a um, gigantic uh, nature engineered project could potentially go out of control. What are the risks that you, you can foresee and how do you mit mitigate? Um, you've put e.g. sargasm growing outside of the desired zone and massive beaching, etc. You're muted, Victor. Mm. Those are good questions. So sargassum has now come into our understanding or our, our, our knowledge because of the problems it's causing on the coasts. But the sargassum that was growing currently is growing outside the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is, a, is this place, it's called the rainforest of the ocean, where in the North Atlantic gyre, subtropical gyre, that sargassum was contained. It was always kept within the gyre. This is also where the plastic garbage, by the way, is collecting, which we would collect together with the sargassum and also remove from the biosphere. So this is another win-win situation. Now, the, uh, since uh, 2011, sargassum has now moved into the subtrop into the equatorial divergence, and th this is a belt of water that extends from Africa to America, right across. And the sargassum growing there gets thrown up on the land, which is why it's causing a problem. But we will be growing the sargassum like the sargassum sea inside the gyres, where it will be contained. Firstly, secondly. The place where sargassum is growing now has some nutrients, not many, but it has some nutrients. That's why sargassum can grow every year again and again. But what we will be doing, we will be growing sargassum with irrigation, with nutrient, deep nutrient <clears throat> water, bringing, we are bringing up deep nutrient water to irrigate the fields. The moment you switch off the irrigation, that those crops will also stop growing. So we have total control over the sargassum. We just need to turn the pipes off or remove them or whatever, and that's the end of the sargassum. It, it won't grow anymore. So this whole system is under control, and sargassum itself is an ancient habitat. It has a, a, a huge number of different species that have evolved in these floating fields of sargassum, like this, the famous sargassum fish, which is perhaps the best camouflage in the animal kingdom. It, it, it looks exactly like the sargassum seaweed, and is not eaten, which also, also shows proves that the sargassum itself is not eaten. It has evolved not to be eaten, right? So we won't have that problem that some monster will come in and chew up our fields. We won't have that. So it's, it's again, as I said in the beginning, it's a win-win situation. We have it under control. And the, the, the bales that we will be sinking on the deep sea floor, they will be beforehand treated in a way to prevent flow through of water. So there will be no breakdown inside these bales. So it will also not be taking up oxygen from the surrounding water. So we won't be uh, uh, hazarding the deep ocean ecosystems either. Thanks, Fix, a great answer. Um, I've got a question here from an anonymous um, attendee. I think, I'm not sure if this is John or Richard, the two of you can fight it out. Um, maybe it's maybe it's more John, because it's, uh, I guess, about commercialization, that it does feed into this farming as well. So this is actually from an anonymous attendee, and they've written, considering the potential benefits of using sarcasm seaweed as a sustainable feedstock for various industries, have you considered making this your main revenue source? And if so, what would your strategy for scaling up production and distribution to meet growing demand? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly answer it to start with. If Richard has anything <laughs> that I missed, um, feel free to dive in. Um, so we are, we're, we're a carbon removal company. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're a carbon removal company. So we're going to be optimizing everything around this idea of removing the CO2 as effectively as possible, or the carbon, should I say, as, as effectively as possible. Um, and so that means growing the crop in a specific way so that it, you know, uh, it, it, it maximizes CO2 absorption, which interestingly may not be to provide it the most amount of nutrients. It may actually be to provide it slightly fewer. Um, uh, and, and actually it doesn't grow quite as fast, but it, it, it takes in more CO2 for what, for what it does grow um, and so on. So um, the benefit of having a secondary revenue source from, from selling feedstocks to industry is, is twofold. One is to subsidize the price of carbon removal, 
So uh, you can't turn it into a biofuel and sink it because it's you know it's the same kind of fundamental components that that um, that you need for sort of both both product pathways. What you can do is you can do a sort of first process and and recycle the nutrients out of the the seaweed before you sink the carbon rich husks. Um, so that way you can then either subsidize your uh, uh, your your carbon removal um, or potentially in the future reuse those nutrients as, as sort of fertilizers in in your own farms so it could be sold to say the agricultural in, uh, industry as an organic fertilizer which by the way most fertilizers come from fossil fuels so again that's fossil fuel abatement from from using these these sort of organically derived um, nutrients um now the benefit of exploring other pathways for how it might be uh used such as bioplastic so um we uh in partnership with a, a new firm called macro carbon and uh carbon wave which is a firm that bases that's based out of puerto rico and mexico um they specialize in sargassum derived products we are going to create sargassum derived feedstocks it's quite a different thing they take those feedstocks and then turn them into products um and in this partnership we're looking at pathways for biopolymers specifically for bio nafta which is 11 percent of crude oil production um now as, as Richard said, we can grow this stuff so prolifically that it's the first real time there's been an opportunity. You know, you can use things like sugarcane and molasses and what have you, but it's so expensive, like two and a half thousand dollars a ton uh, uh, to produce by, by a NAFTA, competing against seven hundred dollars a ton for crude oil based NAFTA. You know, that's we're so we're, we're so far apart and that's even subsidized with, with carbon credits. So uh, with Sargassum, we could potentially get that down to eleven hundred dollars a ton, if not eight hundred dollars a ton. So in my opinion, we just need to kind of prove this pathway. Do we need to make it cheaper to grow sargassum than to dig oil out of the ground? And then what's going to happen? The oil companies are going to switch their supply chains. Um, so, and, and what that does for us is it gives us, you know, ultimately we don't want to be a big, you know, hyperscale farmer that produces feedstocks for the for the chemicals and, and energy industry. You know, we want to create technology that allows them to do this themselves as a kind of byproduct of what we do, but also have this security that if, you know, the demand isn't there for carbon credits in any given year, rather than the business collapsing, actually we can sell our crop for something else. So it actually gives us a very high degree of, of protection against kind of market forces by having options of different pathways to sell our crop. Um, so that's why we're looking so heavily and in, uh, investing so heavily into it is, is so that we remove these vulnerabilities. Fantastic. Okay. Did you have any time to add to that, Richard, or has, uh, has John covered everything? I was going to say exactly the same. No, he um, he, he has very comprehensively covered um, uh, covered it. I mean, we're short term. We're looking at um, actual uh, from the farming perspective um, technology that exists. That's barriers. Um, that's sargassum in the Caribbean areas. Um, it's it's looking at where we can um, achieve real results of farming and um, produce income and, uh, you know, really uh, start our kind of farming journey um, in a realistic kind of time scale. Yeah, and, and I think that's the point when you're closer to shore doing that kind of operations, as Rich mentioned, our catch and grow farms. Um, you know, actually, logistically, it does probably make more sense to turn more of that crop into products because you're close to land and close to existing supply chains. When you're out in the open ocean, you know, you've got to factor in the, the cost of transport, of, of transporting, you know, those raw materials back to land to then be processed. Um, so it's unlikely, not, not impossible, but unlikely that when we are truly in the open ocean, that that much of that crop will be sort of sent back to land. It just makes sense to sink it, you know, where it is. And, and, and you know, the markets, markets predicted to be a trillion dollar market. I mean, the last trillion dollar, dollar market was was the internet right you know they don't come around very often trillion dollar markets and and you know i was at carbon unbound last week uh, in a room full of 240 people and it was you know the entire carbon removal industry being represented in in those 240 people and within eight years we need to get that to a trillion dollar market so you know <laughs> you, you don't have to place many bets on you know you've only got to place 240 bets and, and you'll probably have a a, a sort of multi-billion dollar uh, company uh winner if you will um, and if we don't, then we've got serious things to worry about. 